Hi class, this is Professor Gordon with a Wednesday discussion inspired by, informed by what's in the forum so far. I want to focus on the Charlotte Perkins Gilman short story, The Yellow Wallpaper. Um, and I want to note that yesterday, June 4th, was the 100th anniversary, the centenary of the passage of the 19th Amendment where women, after three generations of fighting, uh, won the right to vote. Of course, the right to vote was not won in the South for women of color until the Voting Rights Act in 1965, but on paper it was won around the country in 1919. Um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman would have been 59 at that point when she could first vote, and I like to use this story to open the semester because it looks back at the 19th century and it looks forward at the 20th century, the second wave of the women's movement, where the battle cry was, the personal is political. And this story is very personal. It's one woman's experience told in journal form. Uh, there's nothing political that happens in it, but it's very political because she's describing an experience that many women had at the time. Um, and uh, she's also claiming the right to write. Gilman was a writer and a painter and also a designer. She had been a governess. And when she experienced periods of depression, her husband at the time, who she later divorced, brought her to a well-known doctor who treated women's issues, women's depression, postpartum depression, and he prescribed a very common cure at the time, the rest cure. And he told her specifically, she reported later when she wrote about it, um, that uh, she was not to, she was to live as domestic a life as possible, never touch a pen, brush, pencil again, as long as you live. So here she was, a writer being told not to write, a painter being told not to paint, and not to engage in intellectual activity, because this would make her uh, sick. Um, in fact, uh, at the time, a very common treatment for uh, women's hysteria was to have their womb removed. So we get the term hysterectomy, which like hysterical comes from the Greek word hustera, which meant womb. So you had women being called hysterical who were not fitting in the box, um, using a word Candace used in one of her questions, uh, could the box of the room that she's in, this square room, be a symbol of the box of the restrictions of a woman's life at that time? And definitely, yes. So uh, women who wanted to, say, go to law school, or who wanted to not have children, or who wanted to live with uh, a woman that they loved and be a couple together, or who wanted to play soccer, <laughs> you know, were breaking the rules of the gender constructs of the time, and they might be labeled hysterical um, and given this bed rest cure or even um, an unnecessary operation, a hysterectomy. So I use this piece because it's very much at the center of the personal is political. Also, it's got a good plot. Uh, it keeps you reading, even though it's pretty long. Um, it keeps keeps you reading, and most times students find uh, they understand it and they, they're gripped by it. Also, it has a very interesting narration. Uh, the point of view uh, is one character, um, and as um, Ben uh, suggests, when he says in one of his questions from the forum, can the audience trust any of the information that the narrator is giving us? It's uh, what we call in English geek land an unreliable narrator because she's becoming more and more insane as we read the story. So, you know, what she's seeing in the wallpaper is probably not literally there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but we, we, we go along with her because there's no omniscient narrator. <clears throat> to come in and tell us anything about her. And we don't know what's going on. It's a limited narrator. We don't know what's going on in the other characters' minds, what they are thinking about her, what conversations uh, John and his sister, uh, Jenny, is it, might be having, um, you know, in the other room about her, you know, is 
Uh, does she have any allies? Does Jenny maybe say, you know, whoa, maybe she, we should get her out of this room. She keeps asking to go downstairs into a different room. She keeps asking to go visit her cousins. You know, uh, we don't know what's going on in their minds. We only know what she tells us about them. So that uh, the point of view and the narration makes it a very interesting story uh, also. Um, um, Okay, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, I want to keep this under, I think, like 12 minutes. Um, so about the point of view, the narration, uh, Andrea asked in one of her questions, how do you think the story would have been portrayed from a different point of view? For example, the husband or Jenny's. Um, and then Alexis also asked, if this story was done in her husband's point of view, what would be his thoughts and motives? That's interesting, and I suggest that uh, if anyone wants to uh, do a creative uh piece here. Um, try to write a scene from the story in John's point of view or Jenny's point of view. That'd be really interesting uh, to see and uh, would deepen our discussion of the piece. Um, now when we when we look at this point of view, this limited point of view, I think we also see um, a narrative gap. It's subtle, but it's suggested by the tone. A narrative gap between the author's opinions and attitudes and the main character narrator's opinions and attitudes. This is a very autobiographical piece. Gilman went through this, later she wrote about it, and I would argue that she healed from it by writing about it, and she reclaimed her voice and her writing power. So she's not the main character, although the main character is her her in the past and her before uh, she, uh, you know, had perspective on her experience of, of depression. Um, so um, I'm I have some quotes here that I want to read as I'm looking at what is this narrative gap? What's the difference between the author's point of view and the main character's point of view? Um, early in the piece, um, and, and I want to quote a question from Candace here. She says, when the narrator goes back and forth talking about what she wants and what she believes is good for herself versus what John wants for her, what do you think her tone is? Do you think she agrees with John? Um, and then Lauren asks, why didn't she speak up when her husband and brother told her she wasn't okay? Was it because they are physicians and she just went with what they told her? Um, Um, she does go along with them at first, but kind of humorously, like, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just uh, keep them happy. And I think later she loses that sense of self. But here early on in the story, the very first page, she says, John is a physician, and perhaps, I would not say it to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind. Perhaps that is one reason I do not get well, faster. You see, he does not believe I am sick, and what can one do? And she goes on, if a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? My brother is also a physician and also of high standing, and he says the same thing. So I take phosphates and phosphites, whichever it is, and tonics and journeys and air and exercise, and am absolutely for forbidden to work until I am well again. So that's kind of light. You know, it's kind of humorous. I take phosphates, phosphites, whichever. Um, personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. But what is one to do? I did write for a while in spite of them, but it does exhaust me a good deal having to be so sly about it or else meet with heavy opposition. Heavy opposition. So she's saying, I know I should write, but when I try to write, it's exhausting to do it secretly because of the heavy opposition. So that's her early on in the story. And notice that pronoun one. She doesn't say, what am I to do? What is one to do, which is a kind of formal, fancy way of speaking, but also I think it suggests that narrative gap I'm talking about. She's like almost distan distancing herself from herself. Not what should I do, but what is one to do? One is this woman in this role, this wife. You got the brother, you got the expert doctors, you got the husband who's also a doctor telling you this is what you should do.
don't write, don't read, don't paint. Um, so as the story goes on, I don't think to answer Ben's question, we can trust what the narrator is giving us, but what the narrator is giving us is important, and it's the focus, and it's the main thing. Um, we don't trust it, but we live it. Um, we're, we're invited to have this experience, and Gilman, her, her writing is good enough that we're, we're pulled in and we ride along, we walk in the shoes of this woman experiencing depression and being told she's not really sick, and being told she shouldn't do the one thing she thinks she should do to get better. Um, John laughs at me, but one expects that in a marriage, she says. There's that one again. There's that narrative distance again. Ah, you know, women are airheads. We expect that. Men laugh at us. It's no big deal that they laugh at us. Um, and then she says uh, later on, 649 in that quote I linked you to, John does not know how much I really suffer. He knows, he knows there is no reason to suffer, and that satisfies him. So John is not able to put himself in her shoes the way we're asked to put ourselves in her shoes. and But she can put herself in John's shoes. She can see his point of view. She can be sympathetic of the way he sees things, whereas we don't see him anywhere in the story being sympathetic of the way she sees things and the way she experiences things. And that inability to put oneself in someone else's shoes is a characteristic of dominant groups. Uh, in a society, the ones who control everything and see everything from their point of view. And, you know, most of the books they read are from their point of view and the theories are from their point of view. So they never had to, growing up, think about the point of view of another group. Whereas the uh, the oppressed groups, we have to think about the point of view to survive. You know, it's just, you know, all the, the most of the, the books I studied in college were by middle and upper class white men. So as a working class a uh, woman, a uh, gender nonconforming woman, I um, was forced to see their point of view. You know, it, it took me a while to have a defense against it and say, oh, this is not the way of seeing the world. This is the way upper class white men see the world. You know, I had to read people of color, read, find working class writers and thinkers and read them. You know, but at, at the beginning, I'm, I was trained to see the world the way they see it. So uh, John can't see her point of view, but he, she can see his point of view. Um, I don't know why I should write this. I don't want to. I don't feel able. And I know John would think it's absurd. But I must say that I feel and think in some way it is such a relief, but the effort is getting to be greater than the relief. But I must say, but I must say what I feel and think. In some way, I have to express myself, but it's getting harder to express myself. I would argue that this is Gilman looking back on and writing about her process of waking up. And it hurts the way, you know, uh, when your leg falls asleep, as it tingles and starts to wake up, that hurts. Um, but we must wake up. She's struggling to take her own experience seriously. Is she getting more sick or more awake as the story goes on? And as she sees the bars in the wallpaper, they're not literally there, but figuratively as a metaphor for this box of social pressure on her, um, they're there. It's a metaphor for where she finds herself in society, society as a writing, thinking woman. Um, and notice at the end of the story, uh, she gets her insanity is that she thinks now she's behind the wallpaper. She projects herself onto the woman who's trapped behind the wallpaper. She becomes her. Um, uh, so uh, the deepest point of her insanity is, in a sense, the deepest point of Gilman's realization that, oh, man, I was trapped. I was trapped. I was like that woman trapped behind the wallpaper. Um, uh, Andrea asks, do you consider John to be a villain in this story? Was he really helping his wife? So if someone wants to do that creative writing of writing from John's point of view, you have to answer that. How, you know, how, how, uh, cold and shut down emotionally is he that he's not picking up on it? Or, uh, can you make him more sympathetic? You know, can you have scenes where he's doubting what he's doing? We don't see him doubting what he's doing, but possibly he was. Um, was he really helping his wife? Um, within the Me Too movement, uh, we can see that there are 
uh, a lot of men who were um, accomplices to what was going on and some who were allies. So you can ask uh, which one is John. And there's not much characterization in the story. And when you have a story that's told from a limited point of view, um, you, you don't have an omniscient narrator who can characterize other people. They're characterized only by their actions. We don't get their thoughts and we don't get their past. So what does John do? How does he act? And the fact that he faints at the end, that's interesting. He's so shocked at her um, uh, dissolution into a kind of insanity that he just straight up faints. So what's going on there? I'd love to get into his head if someone takes that on. Um, I love the prose in this story. Um, and I want to, this is kind of in parentheses here, suggest another creative project. I love on page 650 this little passage, and I really think it's just Gilman remembering her own childhood, and she gives her memory to her fictional main character that was based on her experience, but once she starts writing about it, it's become a separate being, you know, a separate character. But it's page 650. Um, I never saw so much expression in an inanimate thing before. She's writing about, you know, how this wallpaper is coming alive. And we all know how much expression they, inanimate objects, can have. Flashback to childhood. I used to lie awake as a child and get more entertainment and terror out of blank walls and plain furniture than most children could find in a toy store. I remember what a kindly wink the knobs of our big old bureau used to have. And there was one chair that always seemed like a strong friend. I used to feel that if any of the other things looked too fierce, I could always hop into that chair and be safe. So my creative writing opportunity is this. Um, remember a time when you were a child and your imagination saw things come alive, a tree or whatever. Um, I remember once my mother told my sister and I this wonderful story of a castle on a hill that had everything kids would want a castle to have. And But you, you, you could only reach it through a tunnel that went underground, and then under the ground you climbed up and came out in the castle. And the day after she told that story, my sister and I, we were little, we searched the woods like for hours for the entrance to that tunnel, which my mother described it as being under a, a big rock. So we would like, every time we found a big rock, we would look under it and any little opening like a rabbit hole, we would think maybe that's the tunnel. I'm really excited because we believed it. Um, so tell us about some imaginative fancy that you had as a kid, you know, for a creative writing option. And I usually give up to 20 for those and you can send it by email or you can just post it in the journal and just say, here's an extra creative writing that I want to try. Try. Um, um, I'm closing in on the end of this. I try to keep these under 12 minutes. Uh, how am oh, I'm at 17 already. Oops, sorry. So there's two more, uh, uh, comments or questions from the thread, the brainstorm questions thread that I want to touch on. Abigail asks, what is the role of women in the text? Um, and I would say they're not allies. Uh, she needs an ally. She needs someone to just sit and talk to, but she doesn't have it. And that could be symbolic of women's condition then, especially middle and upper class women. You're in the nuclear family. Um, you're not in a community. You're not in a village, um, you know, where you uh, um, can talk to other women. So, uh, well, we have the, the main woman in the story is Jenny, John's sister. And wondering, is she an ally? Uh, our main character says of her, there comes John's sister. Such a dear girl as she is and so careful of me. I must not let her find me writing. She is perfect and enthusiastic housekeeper and hopes for no better profession. I verily believe she thinks it is the writing which makes me sick. But I can write when she is out and see her a long way off from these windows. So she's having to hide the writing from her and and uh, look out for her coming. So she's not an ally of the main character. She's an ally of John, the one who is uh, telling her not to write and stopping her from writing. And I see the tone of that narrative distance, a sort of wink and a smile in the sentence, she is a perfect and enthusiastic, enthusiastic housekeeper. Well, that's great, you know, that someone is a good housekeeper and hopes for no better profession. 
And I, I think there's a little irony in that. I think that's the narrative gap of Gilman looking back and saying, come on now, just being a housekeeper is not a great ambition, you know, especially um, for uh, Gilman herself as a writer. She worked as a governess, you know, so um, I think she's the tone there um, is uh, saying that she doesn't agree with all this uh, that's going on with uh, the prescription of bed rest. Now, there is a Jane mentioned at the end. And there is no Jane in the story, and I almost sometimes think it's a typo that she means Jenny, uh, because right at the end, it's, um, um, I've got out at last. Because now she's projected totally onto the woman in the wallpaper, and the woman in the wallpaper has gotten out, and she's become that woman. I've got out at last, said I, <clears throat> in spite of you and Jane. Here she's talking to John. In spite of you and Jane. And I pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. So who is Jane? Um, I'm not sure if it's a typo or it, her insanity is seeing someone else. Is it an allusion to Jane Austen and Jane Eyre? I don't know. But I do notice that all the women mentioned in the story, um, there's even a cousin. Uh, there's Jane. There's Jenny. There's John. And then there's a cousin. Um, where did I write it here? But I forget the cousin's name. She's, you know, she says, I wish I could go visit my cousin so-and-so. Um, let's say Janice, they all begin with J. So they're all out, they're all, they all have the same first initial as John. I don't know if that's implying that they're all, uh, allies of John. Um, so Candace also talks about the box, as I mentioned earlier, the room as a box. Is that symbolic of what's expected of her as a woman and the constraints and the impressiveness on her? I looked for more boxes and, and uh, metaphors for imprisonment in the piece. I reread it with that question in mind and found a lot of it. The windows are barred. Our main character thinks, well, that must be for the little children. This must have been a nursery, but there are bars on the window. Um, the room is a box, and in the end, she's embracing the box. She says, I can creep smoothly on the floor, and my shoulder just fits in that long smooch around the wall, so I cannot lose my way. So she's literally, you know, crawling around in a square. She's become the box. She's, she's uh, embraced the box, uh, so to speak, the comfort of the cage. Um, but Gilman didn't stay in the box, so we wouldn't have this short story. We wouldn't have her uh, famous utopian novel, Her Land, um, and the other books that she's written. And if anyone wants to use Gilman for the last essay, where you, uh, one option is to focus on one writer and, you know, read them more in depth, uh, Gilman would be a, a great person to do that. She wrote a lot of nonfiction, so if you'd rather read essays than short stories and poems, you might want to do uh, Gilman. But definitely read Her Land. It's a short but amazing a novel of a utopian future uh, where there's been some kind of disaster and there are only women survivors <clears throat> and they create a society. Um, uh, the, a Change of World, the podcast we listen to, uh, opens with the question, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. Um, Adrian Rich asked that in a poem. And that's where we get the personal is political. That's where we get Gilman telling the truth about her depression and how uh, she was oppressed more um, and healed by going against what was the uh, prescription for the day, which was don't write, don't don't paint, don't think, just uh, stay stay quiet in a in a room. Uh, she tells the truth about her life and her world split open. Um, she writes more books. She divorces, she remarries, uh, an ally, a supportive person. Um, and I want to end here with um, uh, quoting Honor Moore, where she talks about the Emily Dickinson poem, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun. It's a poem, I confess, I had never read the way um, Adrian Rich read it. Honor Moore said she went to a reading by Adrian Rich, and Adrian Rich kind of reclaimed Emily Dickinson. Um, as um, a powerful voice rather than a domestic, domesticated person. Um, and she says, my life had stood a loaded gun is really about writing. My life had stood a loaded gun. I had no voice. 
um, a loaded gun leaning in the corner. I had no voice. Then the muse passed, and I began to speak. I began to shoot the gun. It echoed back. My owner passed the muse and carried me away. The writing life carried me away, um, as it did Gilman, too. So we open the semester with this story about a woman told not to write, um, who was made sick by not writing, uh, written the, the story written by an author who did write, and all semester we'll be reading amazing pieces of prose and poetry um, by great women who uh, embraced writing and found their power through that and passed it on to us uh, so that we can um, study it. Okay, sorry, I tried to keep it under, uh, well, 25 minutes, but I'll, I'll, this is the first one, so I wanted to do a little more explaining. Uh, so please, uh, next week, Monday and Tuesday and even Wednesday morning, you can send me questions and suggestions for what I uh, might uh, cover in this little lecture discussion. So it's been great talking to you. Um, seems to have gotten darker while I was talking because it's almost 5 o'clock. All right, take care, and thanks for a great first week's forum. And I'll be talking to you there and here.